Okay, so now we've started exploring relativistic vectors and tensors, let's have a look at a topic which is going to be extremely important throughout special and general relativity, known as Lorentz invariance. So this is really just going to be the kind of start of us talking about Lorentz invariance, as we're going to see this topic is going to run through the core of all of relativity. And essentially now we're just going to start motivating this idea by looking at a few simple examples. So we've already kind of mentioned or started realising space-time as a manifold, which we understand as this kind of abstract set of things that doesn't really have any concrete meaning. The elements of this manifold are just, well, the elements of a topological space. They don't have any concrete real number representation or anything like that. They're just abstract elements of a set, but then on this space-time manifold we construct coordinates, or what we've been calling a reference frame in relativity, so this is just a, a set of maps that maps the points of our space-time manifold into a copy of the real numbers that has the same dimension as our space-time, so our express that as a 1 and then a d for the number of spatial dimensions. This d is just going to be 3 for our universe. But now what we need to realise is that this x nu that we've written down, this coordinate function, is just completely arbitrary. I've just written x mu, I haven't told you what the explicit form of this function is. And now we're going to, or the key thing we need to realise when we talk about the manifold is that any of x mu that I could potentially write down, so long as it satisfies uh, the correct set of axioms to be a coordinate function, there are going to be many functions that are going to satisfy those axioms, we could just as easily have written down some other set of coordinates, say y, I'll give it another index just for completeness, we could just have as easily written down another set of coordinates y that's going to map into now a different copy of our R space-time, of our R on D. But now these two essentially sets of coordinates are just mapping this same underlying space-time. So this X and Y, they're talking about the same underlying topological space, but they're just essentially just assigning different real number representations to the points of this topological space. Okay, so just for a really quick and easy way to visualise this, if we just simply consider now the manifold M is R2, so we just take the manifold to already be some R D, and just I'm going to use R2 for simplicity, and now I'm just going to kind of visually represent just a small, a little bit of our R2, this is just a sort of patch of our M manifold. It extends beyond this picture, but I'm just drawing a portion of it here. And then essentially what we can do on this portion is we now take the points in this manifold, say some point P that doesn't really have any way to talk about what, what that point is in relation with other points. But then we now construct coordinates on our little patch of manifold. So we essentially map all of the local points into, well, I'm, I'm technically mapping into some coordinate space, but I can just draw it on top of the manifold because we're in this kind of simple flat picture. And so essentially what this set of coordinates then does is it just assigns a concrete set of numbers to each of the points in the manifold. So this point P we see here has now coordinates, its x1 coordinate is A and its x2 coordinate is B. But now what we need to realise is that this coordinate set of axes which I've drawn was completely arbitrary. I could have say instead decided to draw not a Cartesian kind of square coordinate grid I could have instead chosen a polar coordinate grid, something that 
looks like this, where we now specify the position of any point by essentially giving its radial distance from the origin and then how far we've kind of swept around from this zero point here. And now what we need to realize is that this is going to assign to the point P. It's going to map the point P into some coordinate R theta. And now we just need to realize that, well, this R and theta, essentially they're just two coordinates, so we can just as equally represent them using two real number axes. But now the actual real numbers that are representing this point P are going to be completely different because, well, the two real numbers of P in the x coordinates were A and B, but then in the polar coordinates we're going to have two completely different numbers here. This is going to be the R coordinate and this is going to be the theta coordinate. So just the point that we need to understand is that the actual manifold, the points of the manifold are kind of free from coordinates. They're they have intrinsic meaning to themselves, and then we just simply assign to those points real number values by defining a coordinate system. But this assignment is essentially arbitrary because we can choose any other assignment and show that everything is going to remain consistent. And so, in order for everything to remain consistent, we're going to need some way to first of all express points in the manifold in coordinates and then have some way to kind of transition between the coordinates because we could define our point in the x-coordinates and then the observer in the y-coordinates wants to ask well what coordinates am I assigning to this point? And we're simply just going to have some fairly simple just they're going to be more maps between these now R spaces, and so these are going to be known as the, well, in the manifold terminology, they're known as transition functions, but for us they're just essentially coordinate transformations. And now, in the relativistic language, we start calling these, well, first of all, we start calling our coordinates reference frames, or we can sometimes call them Lorentz frames, and then we call the, the coordinate transformations between reference frames, we call these Lorentz transformations. So in short, shortly we're going to fully derive the, well first of all, properties that the Lorentz transformations are going to need to satisfy, but essentially they're just going to be maps between our, our space times, and now just because we're dealing with special relativity and things are fairly simple, the underlying manifold that we're dealing with is already one of these R 1D space times, and that kind of simplifies the analysis. But as we move to general relativity and we have to start working now with the general manifold, things are going to get more complicated. But for now, I just want to kind of start introducing you to the idea of a manifold and how essentially the coordinates on that manifold are completely arbitrary, and that the actual underlying manifold itself is the only kind of fundamental and physical object, the coordinates are just kind of trivial representations of that object. And so we always need to be clear that whenever we choose coordinates, we always need to keep in our minds that we're going to have to be able to respect the freedom to arbitrarily change those coordinates at any point. So just write down, we're going to have some rule for transforming between coordinates or reference frames, and we're going to start calling these, giving them the symbol capital lambda, and we're going to go forward and realize that these are Lorentz transformations between reference frames. But for now I just wanted to kind of introduce this so I could start talking about a few other things to do with Lorentz invariance, just starting to get you used to the notion that coordinates don't mean anything, it's only the underlying physical manifold that really has physical meaning, the coordinates are just, in essence, arbitrary assignments of real numbers to those physical manifold points. And so we can just arbitrarily change coordinates however we'd like, and this is going to turn out to be incredibly useful when we start going forward and defining 
specific objects, how they appear in one reference frame, we can just really easily change coordinates, work out how it appears in another reference frame. And we're going to be able to use this to calculate all sorts of things, like how moving observers view the space-time differently to stationary observers, <coughs> and so on.